Well, good afternoon. It's uh, such a joy to be with you, and I want to invite you to open your Bible uh, to the book of uh, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to spend our time together closing out the chapter, verses 19 uh, through 30. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity that uh, I want to take some time to say thank you to Dave and to everyone giving me the opportunity to present the Word of God to pastors. I know that there are many uh, brothers that have been in ministry uh, for a lot longer than I have that could be standing here, but I'm thankful uh, for the Lord giving me the opportunity to share. And I also want to thank uh, my wife for her support and uh, also Word Baptist Church for their love and encouragement. And so we look forward to having a good time uh, in the Word. You see, as uh, Ed put it, uh, he was going to tee uh, things up for me. And I don't know if he used that specific phrase because I look like Tiger Woods or because, you know, he wanted to set the tone uh, for me to come up and share uh, the good news that even though we see things on the decline, Jesus Christ is still on the throne. And even though we know that the statistics are giving us a snapshot of a certain uh, disposition in our denomination, that the plan and the process is still the same. No matter what type of struggle we go through, the plan and the process for seeing men and women, boys and girls, all the nations come to Jesus Christ has not changed since Jesus Christ gave the commission. And so as we look at this text, I'm so excited because we see an example, two, as a matter of fact, specifically two examples of individuals who gave their life to be the witness that Jesus Christ has called us to be. They gave their life, Timothy and Epaphroditus, that's what I'm talking about. And as we look at this passage together, I want to bring to your attention some of the things that have already been shared by my brothers that have gone before me. You see, just like uh, any good preacher, the Apostle Paul, he brings us into an illustration. He's given us commands and he's given us the way in which things should be done. But just like any good preacher, he gives us an illustration of individuals who have followed that. Whenever you hear this statement to have this attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus, you might think, man, that's daunting of a task. You mean you want me to think and behave like Jesus? But what he does is he says, let me give you an example of two individuals that you know, church in Philippi, that do that exact thing. And because they do that exact thing, you can also. And so as we look at these examples, as we look at these two examples, our text is going to show that they were living a life worthy of the gospel. We're going to see that when it came to the way in which they lived their life, they didn't do anything out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but that they looked at other people and they esteemed them high. You see, I remember my wife sharing with me a, a song she learned uh, as a child. If you want to have joy, you just look at how the word spelled, joy, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, yourself. And so we see in these two individuals that they were willing to put Jesus Christ in his interest first. They were willing to put others second and themselves right behind to make sure that they'll be able to execute the ministry that God had given them. I hope that you'd have an opportunity to find Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 says this, Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be encouraged by news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interest. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character. Because he, was, because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Therefore, I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will also come soon. You see, the first thing that we're going to see here is that Paul and Timothy were examples of servant leaders. They were willing to give of themselves. They were willing to give of themselves to be able to lead a life that honored Christ. And we see in this that the first piece is that you see the apostle Paul being in prison. Philippians is a prison epistle. He could have kept uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus with him, but he was willing to send them. He was willing to put his needs on the back burner because the Philippians were in need. And he wanted to know how things were going with them. And so if we're going to be an example, 
for Christ, we have to make sure that we change our disposition, our way of thinking, our mindset. And so we see this. He says in verse 20, he says, for I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. And, and speaking of Timothy, this idea of being like-minded means a kindred spirit, a kindred soul, that he and Timothy were so much alike. They had a kindred spirit for ministry and a love for Jesus Christ that had transformed their, their lives. You see, he was willing to be genuine and open. But he stands as a marked difference between those that had their own agenda. How, how many of you know as pastors we can have our own agenda sometimes? And what I find is, is that many times we, we want to do something and say, God, bless what I'm doing, instead of finding what God is blessing and doing that. And so in, in this letter here, he is showing us that they were willing to find where God was blessing and they were willing to do what he was blessing. They were willing to be selfless, sacrificial. You see, Timothy stood out in a world full of those who were self-seeking. Notice how he says it. He says that he's like-minded, who will genuinely care, care for the interest of the Philippians, care for the things that they were struggling with, care for the things that they were dealing with and battling with as a congregation. He says it like this in 21, all seek their own interest. I mean, all the others, they had this own, their own agenda, own disposition. Uh, on our way here, I, this came to realization in my life. We were traveling here to come to the convention, my family and I, and I've got my, my wife and I've got two children. My daughter's four, my son is one, and we had a goal in mind. We wanted to get to Phoenix so that I could preach the word. But you know, along the way, we ran into a few roadblocks. You know how the, the flights can be, and we missed three of them, by the way. And so having been up at three in the morning, our kids got up at four in the morning, four-year-old and a one-year-old, you know that uh, everything was not a paradise at the Andrews family in that airport. And there were a number of times where I wanted to lay hands without prayer, but you understand that that was not the proper context for that. But I remember distinctly my, my son had his mind set that he wanted to push his, his sister's bag. And I'm thinking in my mind, we've already missed two flights. We can't miss another one. And we, and we need to get on the move. And so he had his own disposition, own mindset. And everybody, you know, everybody in the airport just think, he's so cute and so nice. And, cute. and I'm like, you don't understand, okay? He had his own interest. And so for us, we had our mindset on the goal. And many times in church life, what can happen is, is we can have our own bag and want to be pushing around. And there are people that are willing to smile at us and tell us how cute we are and how wonderful we look as we do those. But understand, it is taking away from the time, the energy, and the effort of the mission. And so when we think about what Christ has called us to, we must make sure that our agendas match his, that our interests match his. You see, he has not changed his mind. He is still King of kings and Lord of lords, and the things that our lives are filled with must make sure that they trumpet that cause. You see, he said they all seek their, their own interest. They want to do things their own way, not those of Jesus Christ. You see, whenever we begin to do things our own way, it can take time, finances, away from the clear, the, the clear call that we are to take the gospel to those who have not heard, a clear call to take to those who are across the street. It can take away from the mission. But as we see here, a Timothy had a mind, an attitude, and a disposition that kept Jesus Christ and his interests first. See, in our lives, pastors, we must make sure that we have this same disposition. Notice what he says in verse 22. He says, but you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. See, I love this statement. He says, you know Timothy's proven character because he has served with me in the, in the gospel ministry. You, you see, whenever you, you see this idea of character, that that's one of the most important assets we have as a messenger of the gospel. You see, we want people to recognize that the message that we share is also the message that we live. Now, what I like to ask the people that were back to church on a Sunday morning is, how many tongues do you have? How many tongues do you have? I'm going to ask you in here in Phoenix, Phoenix, how many tongues do you have? For everybody that said one, wrong. I know y'all thinking, what is going on in Arkansas? You actually have 
three. Let's count them. You have the one in your mouth. This right here. Tongue. Two. Three. You see, the reality is, is that when we think about our character, the one that's in our mouth must be saying the same things as the one that's, in, that's on our shoes, and they must be moving in the same direction. Understand that whenever we have a, a character, whenever we preach the gospel, hear, hear me, we want to make sure that we don't unsay with our lives what we say with our lips. We want to make sure that the gospel message that we proclaim with our mouths can be seen in the, in, in the way in which we live our lives. I like to say it this way. We proclaim Christ with our mouth. We show the effect that he has made in our lives with our feet. We, we show that the, the message has meat to it, that it has root, that our character is real, that who we are is real. And notice what it says about Timothy. He had proven character. He had proven character, meaning Timothy didn't just show up and just say, I'm ready, uh, sign me up now, and, and the Apostle Paul just throw him out there. No, no, no. If you go in Acts chapter 16, what you realize is there was a period of time in which Timothy was trained. And he began to show that he was willing to follow the Lord's commands and edicts and direction as he served in, in Derby and Lystra. And he had a reputation for being one who was faithful. And so we want to make sure that in our lives, pastors, that, that we have proven character, character that has gone through some things, that has, has gone through the fires of trial and difficulty, and that it holds up. So the way in which I look at it is with God's power. Holy Spirit feel power. How many of you know in here that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is inside of you when you have the Holy Spirit of God? That power is what I'm talking about. That power with God's help and his power, if you will watch your character, he will take care of your reputation. He will take care of your reputation. It doesn't matter what people say about you. If you, with that power inside, will watch over your character. I mean, it's him in, it's, it's him in you. Don't, don't get it messed up. But it's all, you are so responsible. That makes sense? If we will allow him to work and move, he will take care of our reputation. But he had proven character. So in our lives, pastors, might it be that the message that we preach with our mouths will also be the message that we live out each and every day. That the tongues in our shoe and the tongue in our mouth will simultaneously say the same thing. You see, it's with our mouth that we, will, we proclaim about the life, death, burial, and resurrection, and return of Jesus Christ. And it's with, our, it's with our feet and our lives that we show that we are serious about that message. That it's not just ink on a page. That it's not just a, a phrase that we use. You know, there are people that will use the word gospel and even use the name Jesus, and they have no desire to ever follow it, obey it, or see it assimilated down into their life. Might it be that our lives will be proven, proven character. Notice how he says it in verse 22, not just his proven character. Notice this, he says, because he has served with me, he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. I love this movement here, this idea of service, meaning it is impossible to serve in, the gospel, in gospel ministry without sharing the gospel. Did you know that? It's impossible to serve in the gospel ministry without opening your mouth and actually telling someone about the gospel ministry. To serve means to proclaim. To serve means to proclaim. Whenever we go out to dinner uh, at a restaurant, you know, that I, I try to think about that, uh, you know, that the fancy one where they, you know, cook the food, um, in front of you, you know, the fancy one, a Waffle House, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There, there, there'll be a, a server there. And one of the things that I um, notice is that these servers are fully committed, fully committed. You see, they're using their feet to move around and go from table to table. They're using their ears to be able to hear the needs of the people. They're using their hands to bring out the food that's been prepared. They're using their mind to understand and know the menu so that whenever the request is made, they're able to take the menu and to apply what the need is so that the people can leave satisfied. You see, when we look at this idea of serving in the gospel ministry, might it be that we might be servants? Now, you might not like Waffle House, but hear me, you, you, we want the church house. You hear me? We want the, the church, the, 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 the place in which God's people gather. We want that to be a place of service where, hear me, whenever somebody comes in, we use our feet to serve them. And hear me, we listen to where they are spiritually hungry, and we take the menu of God's Word, and we apply to them what they need to be able to be filled. 
And what I love is, is that every place you go to is going to have a special. You understand me? They're going to have a special. And most of the time it is in a very distinct marked place. You hear me? Let me just, can I just tell you, we have a special and it's always on the menu. We call it the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's that message. It's that message that we serve up. And so as we look at this example, Timothy was willing to engage, get down into the ministry with the Apostle Paul and serve him, serve with him, serve the churches. Might it be that in our lives we are servants and that we use our ears to hear the cries of the souls of the people that are in our lives. And we take the menu of God's word and we apply that special to it. And we let them know that you can be filled. You can come and have a meal in which you will never hunger again. You can come and have a drink in which you will never thirst again. And it comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we see that, that Timothy is a great example for us, that he is a great example of a life that's worthy of the gospel, that he is a great example of a person that has the mind of Christ, the humility and the disposition but did you notice how the Apostle Paul talks about the dynamics of their relationship? Look with me at the end of verse 22. He says this, like a son with a father. You see, might we not forget that we're a family? Not just because we are Southern Baptists, but because we are Christians, we are a, a family. And he says, he served with me. You don't see any, 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 any hint of, of, of him looking down on Timothy, of him thinking he's better than Timothy. He said, he served with me. He served with me. And when I think about that, we see specifically that, that a father should be present, should be prayerful, should be supportive, that that is a, the, the dynamics in which they live their life together for God's glory. Might that be our disposition, pastors? Not only do we see Timothy as an example, but we also see Epaphroditus. We also see Epaphroditus. Notice with me in verse 25. In verse 25, it says this, but I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need. See, Epaphroditus was a representative from Philippi who they had sent to Rome to be able to bring an offering, a gift to the apostle Paul in his imprisonment. And so Epaphroditus now is going to be sent back. And now as we look at this, the uh, circumstances that Epaphroditus went through uh, were not good. He ended up getting sick. Now, whether he got sick on his way to take the gift or whether he got sick while he's in Rome, we don't, we don't know specifically, but we do know that he got sick. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us, verse 26, since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when, he, when you see him, and I may be less anxious. You see, Epaphroditus is a great example. And I want you to notice these descriptors that the Apostle Paul uses, because Epaphroditus he is a great example of a dedicated, selfless servant. You, you see... One of the things I love about Epaphroditus is that he was an individual of action. He was willing to go to the Apostle Paul. He was not sitting back. And what I find all too many times in the church is that we have a lot of people that want to be spectators as well as commentators. You know what I mean? We have people that want to be spectators. They want to see what's going on. Then they want to sit back and they want to commentate on how things are going. But let me just tell you, we don't need any more spectators or commentators in the kingdom of God. We need more participants. We need more participants. You, you see, the, the playbook has already been given. We already know what we need to say. We already know where we need to go. You know where we need to go? Everywhere. He made it real simple uh, to, all the, to all the earth. You know what we need to share? We need to share the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know the play. We know where the field is. Now, we just need to get on it and quit sitting back and commentating on whether or not we got enough folks on the field or how much. No, no. We need less spectating, less commentating, and more participation in the gospel message of Christ sharing it. But now I want you to notice. I want you to notice these descriptors that the Apostle Paul makes. He says, my brother. Now, I love this because whenever you think about this, this dynamic, he says, my brother. We have Paul, who is a Jew. 
we have Timothy, who was a Jew and a Gentile, and now we have Epaphroditus, who is a Gentile. And so we see that now Paul is calling this Gentile, now watch out now, he's calling this Gentile, my brother. Now this is not just, you know, what happens like in a, in, in a church sometimes when you don't know somebody's name, you say, man, what is his name? Brother, right? That's not, that's not this type of situation here, okay? But this is talking about the, the idea of the dynamics between their relationship that they were close, that they had an affection with one another, that they, there was a, a, a relationship that was there. You mean to tell me that this Gentile and this Jew were able to have an, a, a, a tight affection and relationship to which he would call him my brother? You better believe it because let me tell you, whenever you give your life to Jesus Christ, that is exactly what happens. You become part of God's family. And in God's family, there are Jews, there are Gentiles, there are Jew and Gentile. We've got Timothy, we've got to mix in here. And that's the idea, that when we look at this message, the, the gospel message, that it is the answer for what our culture is still struggling with. It's the answer. Might, might I just say that it is the answer for what our, 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 our culture is struggling with. The gospel message, when you think about the divisions and the, the, the struggle and the strife that we have going on right now in 2017, you would think that we have not learned anything. But you know what? I just remember this carpenter this carpenter, this, this, this carpenter is sitting down with a woman at a well from a, a, a different background and sharing the gospel and bringing her into the fold. I just remember this deacon. Y'all remember this deacon named Philip just sitting with a guy that, that, that was from a whole different country, uh, Ethiopia, and rolled up, got up in the chair with him and began to share. And you know what I found amazing is that God saved them just like he saved the Jews, just like he saved those on Pentecost that, were from, that, that spoke uh, Arab, that came from the peninsula, North Africa, from Europe. What I find is that the gospel message is the answer to what we are still struggling with here in 2017. It's the, it's the answer. It's the answer. Because, let me, can I just tell you why? Because there is a level ground at the cross. You see, everybody comes the same way, level ground at the cross. does not matter what language you speak. does not matter the color of your skin, red bone, yellow bone, dark white, black, blue, red, does not matter. Whenever we give our life to Christ, we are family. And he says, my brother. You see, this church has always fascinated me, the church in Philippi. Because this church was made up of a ragtag group of bunch of folks, you know what I'm saying? It was, I'm telling you, 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 come into, you come into the account, the narrative in Acts 16, and you see the uh, uh, Apostle Paul sharing with a, a, a sister, Lydia, sugar mama, what I like to call her. You know, she had the money, the fine purple, selling it, okay? And, and you know what God does? He opens up her so you can believe. Salvation is a work of God, but guess what? She had to respond. We all know that. And so we see him come in and save Lydia, and they keep on rolling because you know whenever God comes to do a work, he, he comes to do a work. And so there's a, a slave girl there that's possessed, and she is, is, is telling folks fortunes and following the apostle and, and, and calling out. And he's like, look, I can't have you as a medium to which you hear about God. We need to make sure it's a pure vessel. And so the apostle Paul comes out, and we see him, boom, heal her. She comes, and she's loose, slave girl. And then we keep on moving, everybody getting mad because now they can't make money anymore off of her. And you know what they do? You mess with a man's money, he's going to get a little upset with you. And they throw him in jail. And what does God do? Still not finished. Jailer in the jail by night, they in there singing hymns. It's probably some of these hymns we got going on right now. Maybe the Christ hymn they, was, they were singing in there. You never know, but I'm going to tell you, they were singing hymns by night. Jailer gives his life to Christ, comes, comes out, his whole family. And so when you look at this, what I love about the gospel is not only is it the answer to bring the races together, and God will have said, by the way, just read the end. There's a book called Revelation. It'll tell you how this thing end up, by the way. So, so whenever you look at it, it, it even brings socioeconomic folks from different positions financially, different backgrounds, and the common ground is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Not only does he call him brother, but he also calls him a co-worker. Did y'all catch that? He says, my brother, my co-worker, my co-worker. I love that the Apostle Paul uses for Epaphroditus because right here we were first introduced to him, and then we're going to see him uh, here. Uh, my brothers are going to be in chapter 4, verse 18. You'll see his name brought up again, but then from there on out, we don't hear anything else about him. But I love that the uh, Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, is willing 
to say we are co-workers, meaning we are working for the same boss. We are in the same field. And many times what can happen in the church is we begin to act like the harvest is not plentiful. Last time I checked, that verse is still in the Bible. You understand? And so we feel like we have to go and work in somebody else's harvest. So we have to be jealous about what's happening in somebody's life. But hear me, as a co-worker, meaning we are working together for the same boss, can I just tell you, there is plenty of work to go around for everybody. We do not have to take each other's work. We do not have to feel like we have to swipe and take and move. Hear me, the harvest is plentiful. Look at it. When you look out and you see folks lost, you see folks wearing rainbows on them, or you see folks acting up, can I just tell you what God's telling you? Right there. Right there. Right there. When, when you see somebody come and they, and they are struggling, they are addicted to, to, to drugs and, and alcohol, substance abuse, can I tell you what God is saying? He's like, look, you don't have to look too far. It's right there in front of you. Because the same message that set you free, guess what? I just got something for you. Come on in here real close. It will set them free if they will believe. The same message, co-worker in the same field. Then he says, soldier. Now, I know many times when we read this, we want, you, you want me to get in here and just talk about how the soldier, man, we just, we armor up and all stuff. But actually, this particular section, he's talking about the camaraderie, the fact that we are in a spiritual battle. And as soldiers, we need to be together. We need to be able to identify one another. We need to be able to, to come together in camaraderie as we go through this battle that is spiritual. We see it all day long. What we can't see is affecting what we can see. It is a spiritual battle. And we are soldiers. We are to walk with one another. This, this is the idea that when you see this a beautiful picture, you remember Moses, he's having to hold the rods up as the armies are, are, are worn down there. And as he got tired, they started to lose. And they had to come raise them back up, right? And as he got tired, the arms started coming, they started to lose. The idea here is that we come up and we hold each other up. We hold each other's arms up so we can see our God continue to get victory after victory after victory and life after life. You see... He was also a messenger and a minister. Notice he says, to my needs in verse 25, a messenger and a minister to my needs. You see, Epaphroditus was sent. He was sent. He was sent with a purpose and a call. And that's exactly a priestly service. And what I find so amazing is that we, we see him being lifted up for a simple task of just taking the money from Philippi to Rome. Might I just encourage you today? That in the kingdom of God, the Lord will remember things done small in his name. He will remember. He will remember. Maybe you pastor at a church and, and you are back in the back 40 in the country. Nobody knows your name. Nobody knows what you do. Can I just tell you? Somebody knows your name and somebody knows what you do. Maybe you are in here and you're not in ministry, you're not a pastor. Maybe you just you teach Sunday school or you are just faithful to go and make visits at the hospital. Can I just tell you that, that God, it amazes me that he would highlight a, a Paphroditus. Just bring in, bring in the money. He knows you and he remembers. The last thing that I want to see is that, you know, ministry can be costly. For Paphroditus, it, it almost cost him his life. Did y'all did y'all catch that? In verse 27, it says this, indeed, he was sick that he nearly died. See, ministry is costly. We, we must recognize that in ministry that there can be some uh, times in our life that, that, that there are struggles and difficulties and that it's costly because the work that we do, let me just tell you, it's an eternal work. And whenever you go into ministry, as you are in ministry, just remind yourself that ministry is costly. But I just want you to know something. He tells us here that God had mercy because his mercies are new every day. Even though ministry is costly, even though ministry is difficult, God's mercies are new every day. And we see him dispense one of those to the Apostle Paul by not allowing Epaphroditus to pass away. I want to close this afternoon this way. For people that have faithfully served in ministry, that have dedicated themselves, maybe it's almost cost them their life. The Bible is very clear on how we need to treat those individuals. Notice what he says in verse 29. He says, therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor. Not just him, but people like him. Those that come off the field because they are sick, serving in ministry. And they come, have to come back home and their assignments and their minds are shortened. 
we hold them in honor. Those that in the midst of their ministry, their family struggle, marriages struggle, we hold them in honor. Because there are some times that whenever they come home, we, we think that something is wrong with them. Like, what secret sin do you have in your life for this to happen to you? And I'm just going to tell you, that's not necessarily the case. And I know that, that Paul knew that there would be a chance for, for the church in Philippi to think that it was something that Epaphroditus had done wrong. And he was trying to tell them, no, I'm proud of him and I'm sending him back to you. And it's going to be a great excitement. I won't be anxious about his health and it's going to be an honor for you. I'm thankful. Might we recognize that whenever we see people go through difficulties and distresses, we hold them in high honor. What we must remember is that God should get the glory, but his service should be honored. You see, might we be clear on the gospel message that our lives would be used for his glory, that we will be an example, that we'll be an example of those who have a changed mind and our disposition is different and we, 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 we are able to understand that the gospel message is our stewardship and that we're willing to pay the price with our life. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. That Lord, you'd help us to have character that honors you. That Lord, you'd help us to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. That Lord, you would remind us that you are faithful. And Lord, you are calling us to be faithful. You see and you know what happens in our life. Lord, we lift up those who deserve honor for their diligence in their service to you. Well, maybe they're in this room because they, they got moved from an a, a, a assignment early because of health struggles or financial difficulties or whatever it is, Lord, you know. And Lord, we just lift them up and we thank you for them. And we pray, Lord, you would encourage them. And then, Lord, you'd use them for your glory. Lord, we thank you for your word and we pray that you would help us to be about your business because we won't be able to witness forever. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.